This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We've got game number two between the Heat and the Knicks coming up tonight, and also game number one between the Lakers and the Warriors. A lot of fun in the NBA playoffs. We'll break down both those games for today and take a look at the Wells Fargo Championship by talking to Brandon Gadula, getting his read on everything going on across the next couple of days. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, joined here as mentioned by Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. He is a senior managing editor of NumberFire.com. Brandon, welcome back to the show. How are you doing today? Good, good. I uh, had a good uh, weekend with uh, the golf recommendations. Uh, yeah, you did. As, as good as it can be, technically. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, would always like someone to win at longer odds than what we had with Tony Finau. But you know what? A winner is a winner, and it was good value. And we talked about the process why. If I hit a plus 850 group at NASCAR, I'm ecstatic. <laughs> so I don't care if they're a favorite or not. Plus 850 is plus 850. Value is value. You said he should be 7 to 1. And he won. So there you go. We'll talk about uh, the full, and it wasn't just Fee now too. Uh, Joseph Bramlett top 10. It was a, he was chopped, but like, you know, uh, dead heat, but like it's still top 10. Got a good payout there. Wyndham Clark over Gary Woodland. We'll go through all of last week's bets, recommendations, and talking about uh, some draft stuff later on too. But hey, you know, um, we had this long running joke on the show about how you'd come on the show and then the next week you'd recommend a winner. But you've recommended a couple winners in the past month on the show here now. So maybe maybe you're getting your timing correct and not recommending the good stuff at the wrong times. I will try to do better uh, yeah, with should. that. Um, but yeah, um, like the weeks that I miss, uh, you know, I have someone that I recommend and and, and back who who wins. And I'm, I'm glad to kind of get a couple of these on air. Are you talking? I'm assuming you're talking WWE draft. No, it's OK. Definitely not. Um, I may need to lean on you more for golf, though, because Ross Chastain cannot wreck a lap car to ruin nat golf bets, uh, whereas he can for NASCAR. So it's true. You know. That, that's a positive. We're going to talk about those two NBA games first. We'll start off there and then dive in to uh, the PGA Tour at the Wells Fargo Championship in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We're going to have a Kentucky Derby podcast coming up later on. I mentioned yesterday that it would be up uh, last night, but had some technical issues. So we're going to record that Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe Thursday. Who can say it's a busy week? We're going to find a time at some point to record that and talk about the Kentucky Derby and let you know where the value lies there uh, by talking about that over at FanDuel Racing. So make sure you're subscribed to get that, whatever it may go up. Uh, Search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe, and if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating as well. Speaking of that, the biggest horse race of the year is here, and there's no better time to get in on the action on FanDuel Racing because right now all customers can get a no-sweat derby bet up to $20. That means you get $20 back if your win bet doesn't win or up to $20 if your win bet doesn't win. The FanDuel Racing app is super easy to use, safe and secure, and when you win, you get paid fast. So don't miss out. The derby is coming up this Saturday. Just visit racing.fanduel.com for your chance to get a no sweat derby bet up to $20 on FanDuel Racing. That's racing.fanduel.com. Age and residency restrictions apply. Offer valid on first derby win wager. Refund issued in non-withdrawable racing site credit that expires on June 12th, 2023. Restrictions apply. See terms at racing.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dig in now to these two NBA games for tonight, Brandon, beginning with game number two between the Heat and the Knicks. Right now, the Knicks are six and a half point favorites. The the total here is 206.5, and Jimmy Butler did it again in game one, but now he's banged up, officially listed as questionable with his ankle injury. What's your read on this game here, game two between the Heat and the Knicks? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Jimmy coming down with the ankle. um, Can't imagine that in any, any way, shape, or form, he is 100% for this game, which as someone who does 
you know, modeling stuff, it's hard to account for, okay, well, Jimmy might play, but be less efficient. How do you kind of factor that in? Um, I think I saw somewhere that someone said his ankle was the size of a baseball, which ain't great. Which part of the ankle? I don't know. Is I don't it know. a baseball lumped on top of like the ankle? Like I've got to, because like, if, if this is like on top of your ankle, that seems not great. It, yeah. I've got uh, visual medium. Shout out YouTube. I don't know. I can ask my, my like my brother's a physical therapist, but I'm more than clueless when it comes to like the human anatomy and how that would even happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, I mean, obviously for Jimmy, unfortunately he's he's not 100. percent But the Knicks yeah. also listing Julius Randle was questionable. Randle, of course, missed Game One, but Jalen Brunson also questionable. Uh, three ankle injuries here, really making it hard uh, to break things down. Uh, for this game, uh, Nick's coach Tom Thibodeau said on Monday that Julius Randle was doing pretty well. Um, don't know if that's good news for his, like his ability to play. Don't know really where Jalen Brunson is going to wind up. I'm assuming Brunson is more likely to play than Randle, uh, but I really don't know. Uh, of course, this is a much bigger deal for for Jimmy Butler to miss for the Heat. Uh, their net rating jumps down from a plus three with Butler active and some other controls in there, like the Tyler hero situation down to a minus 4.3. So uh, as I'll get to in a second, it, it's not, every, it's not always the case whenever you take a good player off the floor that a team is but like below average, it's just not always the case, but it is the case with, with the heat. And if anyone's really been watching the heat in the playoffs, they, they realize like if Jimmy Butler's not going, this team has some issues. The Knicks, with and without Randall, are a plus five with him and a plus 4.3 without him, respectively. So, like, that's not too bad. Yeah. Without both Brunson and Randall, they're still a plus uh, 1.9, which gives them an edge if Jimmy is out. They would be wor a worse team with Jimmy active, assuming Jimmy's fully healthy. Then you got to factor in home court, all that kind of stuff. So... I'm really struggling with this one. Uh, you know, if this was a full regular season slate, I wouldn't even look at this game really. Uh, I, ju I just, I just frankly wouldn't. But the thing is, in Game One, the Knicks lost despite a better field, uh, effective field goal percentage, fifty-one point seven percent to fifty percent, which are both not not particularly good. There, uh, the Heat just didn't really turn it over, which helped them like absorb the elevated offensive rebounding rate for the Knicks. One of the biggest differences was free throws. Uh, 23 of 29 for Miami, 12 of 20 for New York. Uh, the Knicks shot just 25% on wide open threes. They were 4 of 16. And the Heat, 9 of 18, which is 50%. But, you know, that the underlying data for game one says that the seven-point game was more like a 2.4-point game. Butler's not going to be 100%, even if he plays. Randall's, you know, on-off impact isn't that huge. And so if I can sit here and say, like, we know Jalen Brunson's going to play, which I, I, I'm not saying that. I don't know. But like, right. if he were fine, I'd say I feel good with the Knicks money line. I see that. I see the path to that. I ran all the different iterations of how this game could wind up based on the health of those three guys. And, you know, it's basically a, a Knicks win so long as they're not without uh, both of those guys, because I don't see how Jimmy Butler's a hundred percent. And I don't know who's going to step up uh, in Butler's absence. And, you know, frankly, one thing to think about is, um, the Knicks were not particularly pleased with the officiating. Seems like they were wanting a lot more calls. Again, nine fewer free throws. I think that kind of levels out uh, for game two. So if I had to bet anything, I'd go Knicks money line. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I'm fine waiting throughout the day until I get a little bit more uh, information that could put me behind the eight ball. But sure. I think that that's something that I feel comfortable doing because I don't want to back a team that has uh, no Jalen Brunson or, or Julius Randle. And a non-bet is always better than a bad bet. So never a bad thing. Uh, the, the, the Knicks money line right now, minus 290. It sounds like you're okay just passing on that entirely, correct? Yeah, I would rather pass on it. Um, if I had to bet, if I had to recommend anything, like I said, I would just go. Because you can't just say, okay, all these guys are out. It's going to be an under. That's all right. accounted for because the under is so low. Right. Um, frankly, these teams are not shooting particularly well, but they could clean the offensive glass, get easy put back. So yeah. um, I would go I would go Knicks if I had to go anywhere, but frankly, I'm just I'm more interested in the nightcap for tonight. 
So let's talk about that nightcap. Right now, we've got the Lakers and the Warriors for game number one. Warriors are four and a half point favorites. Total here is 228. And the Warriors needed seven games to get past the Kings. And the Lakers resting up since Friday. Is that rest enough to cover a four and a half point spread here, which has tightened since things opened because it was five earlier on? Yeah. Um, look, the the Warriors are still scary. And um, frankly, the Kings crowned them in game seven. Um, they made Kevon Looney look like Bill Russell. Uh, <laughs> they could not slow down Steph Curry. I mean, Clay Thompson was off. They didn't really get a whole lot of help. Otherwise it was basically just, uh, it was tough. Um, I'm not saying that the Lakers don't have that ability to, to let the the Warriors come out and, and get a, get off to a great start in the series, but uh, they've been playing so well with their core of LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and D'Angelo Russell all together. I know I talk about the, it seems like I talk about the Lakers on every Tuesday when we do this. All right. I guess that was Wednesday last week. I don't even remember, but um, they're 12 and three with all three active. Their point differential was a plus 10.9, 10 and five against the spread. They're just a different team. So this is something that, you know, we're not going to get into like, I mean, we, we've gotten in in the past is what I mean, like with how I model stuff and it's based on active rosters and rotation and health. If you look at like long term uh, data, you're going to have trouble with with uh, with the Lakers. And so a lot of long term models just kind of a lot higher on the Grizzlies than they were on the Lakers. Um, but yeah, I, so for me, I'm, I'm pretty high on the Lakers right now. And it's because I have reason to believe that they're, as you would say, their most relevant sample is that of a really strong team. Now the Warriors are 35 and nine at home in the regular season and playoffs. Frankly, both had pretty good first round opponents. And if you look at just the data of how they each team played, the Lakers played better than the Warriors. You alluded to it in the fact that the Warriors went to game seven, um, the Lakers closing it out earlier than that. So my model for tonight likes this uh, still new look Lakers a good bit. I, Loved it at five. I still love it uh, at plus four and a half uh, for the Lakers taking the points there. And my model also likes the under at 228. These are two good to great defenses. There's not quite enough pace uh, to overcome it. I could really see the Lakers coming out and slowing things down, trying to mitigate uh, the offense of the Warriors. So uh, I, you know, I could also see the Warriors just lighting it up because that's always the case and betting unders against the Warriors is one of the more nerve wracking things you can choose to do uh, to yourself. But uh, for me, uh, my favorite plays for the night across both games are uh, the Lakers plus four and a half and the under at uh, 228. Now let's talk about the Lakers side here. You mentioned how your model likes the spread at plus four and a half. Do you give any consideration towards the money line? It's plus 162 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Is that long enough where you're tempted at all? Or do you want the safety of the points? I'm tempted. Um, it is good value. Uh, frankly, I have this one close to a pick mm. Um I just don't always, I don't really like to go. So again, here, it, this, this is a case where I'll talk about this a little bit with the golf model. As we talk about golf, uh, the model says mathematically Lakers, s- s- the slightest favorites for me. Uh, uh-huh. I see some other models that are similar to that, uh, but I'm factoring in the, the Warriors trying to build off of a game seven rally where they looked untouchable again. Um, I don't love that. So I'd rather just take the points, frankly, but I wouldn't fault anyone uh, for, for going the route of a Lakers uh, upset, you know, technically there as their underdogs, uh, a Lakers upset in game one. I'm just being a little bit more cautious and just taking the points. I took the money line. I <laughs> love it. I will not blame you if it doesn't go well. Just so no, you know. like again, this it, is on it, me. <laughs> you 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 laid out the the pros and cons, so you did your job. I just took my preferred route. <laughs> <laughs> Playoff basketball is such a combination. That's why I like golf because it's like math, yeah. but like the eye test and certain different things you can throw in. But playoff basketball really feels like you know you can like you you can like a game and be off by. 20 oh, yeah. 30 points of this because like just of how things snowball and it's really tough and, and things are magnified so i'm just i have flashbacks of classic warriors to the point that yeah. uh, for me right now just give me the points 
and and I'll feel better uh, that way. But again, I wouldn't fault anyone for the money line. So I think you did the right. I think you did a, a very acceptable thing. And again, um, my model has the Lakers f- like favored by 0. 0.1 points. That implies value on plus 162. Yes. Value is value, as we discussed last week in the PGA. So Brandon uh, likes the Lakers plus four and a half, not the money line, but then does like the under 228 for that game as well. Speaking That's just of value, I'm a coward. well, I'm not. I'm reckless. So <laughs> anyway, not that 162 on a money line is reckless. Yeah, but yeah. Hey, you know, you bet enough NASCAR, you become okay with uh, losing bets. Well, so. I think too the, the the maybe a line of distinction here is. Um, I watch a lot more basketball than you do, so I. I don't want. <laughs> I, I I've fear... had plenty of it on recently, but 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 over the years, whenever Steph Curry's out there dropping fifty, and no one has any way to like, yeah. Well, also, it helps if you can push off every. It's time been you two full it. days since he last dropped fifty in a playoff game, Brandon. Like, let's not live in the past here. <laughs> like, come on, two full days. It's 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 that's ancient history at this point. Speaking of value is value. Let's talk now about the PGA Tour. They are at Quail Hollow for this week for the Wells Fargo Championship. And we'll talk about Rory McIlroy being a prohibitive favorite for this week in a second. But first, what should we know about Quail Hollow before we placing our bets this week? Uh, yeah, long par 71 winning scores historically around uh, 10 under, although Rory won, I think, by seven shots at 21 under a few years back. Um, the kind of course where it's a, we haven't had, like, it's a, it's a storied course, but we haven't had, we haven't had this event at this course yearly. It's been like up and down. So last year, the president's cup hosted, uh, so no event from last year at this course, it was at TPC Potomac. Um, but in 2021, we had it, uh, no event in, uh, 2020, but in 2019, 2018, so basically 2018, 2019, 2021 are the recent years with with uh, you know Wells Fargo data uh, for uh, Quail Hollow. So just keep that in mind if if you're someone who does like to look back at at, at finishes and in, in performance at a particular course. But uh, overall, I mean, distance matters pretty typically. Um, it's just kind of a, like a tough all around test, which is why the winning scores are around like 10 under. Uh, pretty much nothing's easy here. Just makes for like a good all around setup. We got the designated field. Uh, you know, the thing that I always say is it's somewhat similar to like a major where the field's really good and the course is not, you know, you're not going to win at 28 under par unless you're, you know, Rory going even crazier than he did uh, a couple years. I can't remember the year, but uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good, it's a good week for golf. It's one of my favorite weeks, uh, favorite types of week where 10 under can win. That makes the uh, the top of the field basically rise to the top. And the top of the field is rising in the odds board, too, because Rory McIlroy is 7-1 to one to win over at FanDuel Sportsbook. You mentioned his history here at Quail Hollow, but Rory right now coming off a brief hiatus, missed another elevated event after the Masters, missed the cut there. So there's some shakiness in the form for McIlroy, but good Quail Hollow history, 7-1. to one. The market believes in Rory. Do you, do you believe enough in Rory to see value at seven to one? I don't know. And my model does not either. Um, so he's got three wins at this course. Uh, he's a bit overvalued. I can see why he shortened from mm-hmm. plus seven fifty to plus 700, but I'm not betting him personally. Um, he is long off the tee. We know that yeah. he's going to gain strokes. He, he gains strokes off the tee every single week. And that's a really gives him a really high floor, but the irons has haven't really been up to par uh, for him, and the short game itself is never his like true strength. But it's a lot better than most people realize. People really like tend to dog Rory for like the putting and, and the chipping and stuff. But he's generally pretty solid there, uh, at least relative to what like the the Rory haters would would think. Uh, but for me, yeah, I, I don't see the value there. I think he's a little bit uh, too short. At, I thought he's too short at, at plus 750. I, th- I definitely think he's uh, too short at plus 700 now. Okay. So after Rory, there is a pretty big drop off. Uh, the next one up is Patrick Cantlay, 15 to 1. So if we're not betting Rory and we think he's overvalued, is there value elsewhere in the outright market this week? Yes. I think it is on that name you just mentioned uh-huh. with 
Uh, Patrick Cantlay, he's is he still fifteen to one? He is. Okay. Um. Okay, so I have him at thirteen to one. I think he's the best value of the week. Cantlay is basically doing everything really well, but hasn't quite put it all together in the same week. He's had a lot of like close finishes uh, to winning, and that's exactly what you want to see from a golfer who has just plus stats in every category but hasn't necessarily put it together. It's a good number. Uh, it's a, it's a value. Uh, you know, again, I have him at 13 to one really good ball striker and he might not seem like it cause he's like slow and kind of like boring to watch, but that doesn't mean he's not like long off the tee and ha- has great iron. So I like him. Uh, and then here's the thing that I was kind of alluding to. I still see, or at least my model still sees value on Tony Finau at 17 Love to one it. slightly, but it's there. Uh, my model and, uh, you know, I don't change things to fit sort certain narratives or anything, but doesn't really account for like a, a negative impact after, sure. after like coming off of a win. But then again, back-to-back wins are not unheard of. Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't have to like grind out to a win, uh, it, it, in Mexico last week. It's not like so. the press tour you go after on after like the Masters and stuff like that either. It's just, you know, it's a win. He, I saw uh, on the golf subreddit. Um, he was caddying for his kids. Yeah, that's yeah. I think he, I think he's probably not uh, not too fried if he's if he's doing yep. well, he probably would do that anyway because he's, right. he's done a female. But right. he also won while his family was there with him. So uh, yeah. full swing, you'll have to find a new new slant on Tony. <laughs> it's Maybe. a normal family. Find a new slant. Yeah. But yeah, I think those two are the best values among the top of the board. Uh, for this week, but I'm also I'm cool with uh, Tyrrell Hatton. At okay. plus, but he's a uh, 48 to one. He's longer off the tee than a lot of people think. He's a top 10 ball striker in the field over the past 50 rounds, according to Data Golf. Tough event, and he tends to play better, at least from the eye test. Tends to play better at these tougher setups. And uh, I'll also throw in Sahi Thigala for mm-hmm. kind of the first time ever. Uh, 50 to one. He's long off the tee, 34th in approach, 14th in combined short game. Love that fit. And he's finally at a number that I think is comfortable. So uh, I was not in on, on Sahith whenever he was getting a lot of buzz. I think that luster starting to wear off a bit. And now uh, again, what my model basically does is, is <laughs> does all of like the objective stuff for me and yeah. tells me, okay, he's, he wasn't worth it at like 30 to one. But now that he's 50 to one in this field, he is actually, you know, uh, worth targeting, targeting there. So I'm um, going to keep it relatively short for the outrights uh, with Cantlay, Finau, and then Hatton and, and Thigala are a good enough numbers where I can uh, uh, get to them as well. Yeah, Thigala 50 to one, Hatton 48 to one, Finau 17, Cantlay 15. Um, and I went to check good old Rhode Island sports book to see where Cantlay was like, Oh, 15 to one at FanDuel. You say 13 to one. He's 12 here. So I need to move. And I am excited to do that. Don't I'm sick of trips to Connecticut and Massachusetts. Let's get on out of here. But uh good value on Patrick Cantlay 15 to one. If you can get that over at FanDuel sports book, what about the non outrights? What do you see in there for this week? Uh, I have a top 10, Tom Kim plus 600. Mm-hmm. Someone who's, he was 50 to one. Uh, to win, but the the top ten numbers a lot better than that. I don't like him as an outright though. Um, it's not like I would fight anyone who like wanted to to bet <laughs> him. But I'd hope not. <laughs> the uh, the top ten, well, I'd fight you on stuff, but yeah, that's fair. The the top ten numbers good uh, for him. We know he's a great iron player, uh, but just mathematically uh, that value's there. And then Kyung Hoon Lee top twenty plus four fifty. Uh, just a well-balanced golfer doesn't really struggle uh, anywhere. I always like that kind of profile for a course like this. So those are the two finishing positions I like. And then I don't mind, um, you, you know, you could throw these in for outrights, but maybe first round leader, uh, Keegan Bradley and Wyndham Clark. Oh boy. Uh, Back on Wyndham this week after he was lost him for the first uh, couple yeah. of days last yeah. week. Long off the tee though. But that's the thing. Like, 
you can't look at that and say, okay, I cannot touch yeah. this guy anymore. That's not yeah. the case. He had a whole year or 50 rounds or whatever sample to get you to last week. It was a good course fit. Pretty similar course setup uh, this week than last week. Accuracy matters a bit more this week, but that's not it's not substantial. So uh, if you want some darts, those two guys make a lot of sense from a ball striking standpoint to get out to an early lead. And frankly, I'm always kind of okay with the long shots that I feel like are values, but I don't see if they're if I don't see like Wyndham Clark holding off Rory and Cantlay and uh, the the Stone Cold Killer now Tony Finau, uh, but it, you know their their first round leader, leader odds are like a bit longer. Than yeah. Their act- so it's like may as well just kind of back the the like iteration where they get out to a really hot start. Right. And then especially Keegan, get... where we know that like the yeah. larger you expand the sample, the odds that he torpedoes yeah. six off the greens are higher. Yeah. So I don't, I don't mind those as like as partial units um, yeah. just for something else there. Uh, I do. And I do see value. It's not like I'm just looking for right, stuff right, that right. just to kind of round things out. But uh, yeah, I think uh, we're going to get one of the, one of the sort of favorites to win this week. Cause it's a designated event and that's basically what's been happening. So keep that in mind and don't get yeah. uh don't get too over eager with like super long shots this week. I'd say the Keegan Bradley first round leader, 60 to one Wyndham Clark, 85 to one KH Lee top 20 plus 450, and Tom Kim top 10, six to one as well. That is Brandon Gadula. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Gadula 13 back with us later on again today. We'll be talking about uh, DFS stuff for the Wells Fargo. Brandon, I appreciate the time as always. Congrats on the Tony Finau win last week. We'll talk to you once again in the very near future. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. All righty. That is Brandon Gadula. Find him on Twitter at Gadula13. We'll have him on again. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the uh, DFS side of things later on today on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. But for right now, we got to go back through last week's bets. Had to uh, change the order of this, not do it on Monday because NASCAR caught postponed to Monday. So let's recap last week, including the NFL draft. We were talking draft with Dr. Ed Feng. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank and Ed. Uh, Had some close misses here in the draft. The one hit was Paris Johnson to be the first offensive lineman taken. That was minus 250. That did hit the Cardinals traded back up to six to take. And we talked about Johnson to the Cardinals specifically on the show last week. Didn't bet that, but uh, he was minus 250 for first offensive lineman. And that one did work. The close miss for Ed was Dalton Kincaid. Ed had him under 24 and a half at minus 122. But then the Bills took him 25th overall. So the over hit there. Couldn't quite get that one. Key, uh, Kincaid was the first tight end taken, which we had discussed. But it was not recommended. Not good enough value to bite there. But hopefully he took the bait anyway. Couldn't quite get that one on Kincaid. Ed had the Raiders taking a corner with their first pick at plus 175. There was a rumor from Peter King, I believe it Peter King, saying that they were trying to trade up uh, in that first round. Didn't trade up. They got uh, Tyree... Uh, Tyree Wilson at seventh overall. Devon Weathers- Witherspoon went fifth overall, plus 175. Maybe that was their trade up target, but couldn't quite get there. So that one did not hit, as Wilson is a an edge player. Uh, final one was uh, over four and a half quarterbacks in the first round. It was plus 144 when it recommended it. It eventually got to plus 158 on the other side. So you could have taken plus 144 over, plus 158 under. Hopefully we did hedge. Uh, We saw during the day on Thursday, maybe it was Wednesday, Thursday or Wednesday, where that number slid the other way. So you got CLV if you were able to hedge, but if you actually look at what it was when the draft started, I believe it had gotten all the way back out there where the uh, over was pretty similar to what it was when we had talked about it because there was a lot of uh, decrease in hooker buzz. Will Levis obviously wound up slipping. So hopefully you hedged. We did talk about it, but uh, Ed said, didn't want to. So some close calls there. We'll talk about the NFL draft uh, with Ed. We recap on Thursday. We'll talk about the UEFA Champions League semifinals as well. We'll get Ed back on here to close up thoughts on the draft. And then find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank and check out his work at thepowerrank.com. Hopefully you were able to win some of that back with the Mexico Open as discussed with Brandon. Good week there. Uh, he is on Twitter at Cadula13. He said he liked Tony Finau to win at plus 850. His numbers had Finau at 7-1, to one, and Finau did win over John Rahm. So plus 850 winner there. Other outrights for Brandon were Luke List and Alex Smalley, both at 65-1. to one. 
Brandon also did hit a top 10 in a matchup. The top 10 is Joseph Bramlett. Recommended at plus 410. It was in a tie for 10th, so didn't get the plus full uh, plus 410, the full plus 410 because of dead heat rules, but that did cash. Uh, matchup bet was Wyndham Clark over Gary Woodland of minus 134. Clark finished 24th, Woodland 39th. So good calls there by Brandon. Other top 10 that didn't hit was Lee Hodges, 5-1. to one, But overall, great great week again by Brandon on his stuff. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Gadula13 and find his PGA Sims over at numberfire.com. Our EPL guest was Austin Cass. You can find him on Twitter at Austin Cass. Another really nice week for Austin. In the Brentford match, Austin had Brentford to win at minus 155 and Yvonne Tony to score a goal at plus 110. Brentford was down 1-0 in the 80th minute. But then our guy, Yvonne Tony, scored to tie things up at 1-1. And then Brentford scored again, I believe in the 94th minute, so in stoppage time, to get the win. So the minus 155 money line cashed, the Tony goal cashed, good call by Austin on both those. Other Saturday bet was Brighton over one and a half goals and minus 178. They won 6 nothing. so cash that as well at minus 178. The lone miss uh, for Austin was Alexander Isak to score at minus 105. Newcastle did score three goals, but Isak was not one of them. So all in all, another awesome week for Austin. Find him on Twitter at AustinCast and find his EPL betting guides over at numberfire.com. Finally, for NASCAR, I had a very annoying week. It was great. Very annoying. In Xfinity, I had uh, Derek Krause plus 600 for a top five. Riley Herbst at plus 275. Herbst, never super competitive. Krause got caught speeding on pit road. I don't think he would have been top five anyway, but kind of put the nail in the coffin there. Not ideal on the Xfinity side of things. In the Cup Series, I had Kyle Larson to win at uh, 5-1. to one. Kevin Harvick top 10 at minus 160. And Brad Keselowski top 10 at plus 140. Larson, I think, had the best car. But he got wrecked. Uh, Ross Chastain, as mentioned, wrecked a lap car. They spun. Larson hit them. He was super fast. He had worked his way up from 18th. Uh, He was running second or third at that time when the crash, or third, I guess, when the crash occurred. I felt great about that bet. A five to one. Pretty big bummer to miss out on that one. Harvick had a tire go down at the end of a stage. Lost a lap. Never got it back. He finished poorly. He was running like fifth or sixth or so before that tire issue. So that was annoying. Uh, Brad Keselowski did cash at plus 140. He finished eighth. He had a pit road penalty, but still came back to win or not to win. Finished top top 10. I had an outright on Keselowski too. Thought he might have a chance in that last restart because he had four fresh tires, whereas others did not. But he had pretty bad restarts the entire day. So couldn't quite get the outright. But the only recommendation here for the show was the top 10 at plus 140. So annoying week for me in NASCAR. But luckily, Brandon... Able, Brandon Austin able to help me win back some of that via the EPL and the golf recommendations. That's all that we have here for today on covering the spread. As mentioned, three more shows coming up this week. We got the Kentucky Derby. We're going to have Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV on to preview that. Uh, depending on when schedules align, we'll have Ed on to talk about some UCL stuff. We'll talk uh, some MLB, some NASCAR, some. EPL coming up on Friday. All that is available on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. So search for that wherever you get your podcasts. Hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating as well. Big thank you once again to Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. Find his work over at numberfire.com. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across Uh, the NBA for tonight. We'll talk to you once again in the very near future. Talk some Kentucky Derby. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 